That twist of fate we were just talking about. Banned away from Scout. Gangplank banned away from Flandre here. The Gwen banned. That Lucian, a consistent ban. The Swain being banned as well. So it is a center. Tom Kench, though, for Viper and Mako. That is a strong old bottom lane to start things off for EDG. Yeah, and they're going to answer with the Callista and then picking up that Talia. It's going to be in the mid lane where we expect to see her more often. Obviously not a flex here because they have a Viego, but FPX going for a pretty powerful mid-jungle duo and that aggressive AD carry. They are into the center Tom though, which is something really high prior in this patch. Much harder to burst out the center before level six when she gets the safety net from the Tom. And they can just harass you down, use that percentage HP damage on the passive. Now, this third pack, probably expect a jungler. You can maybe uh, pick up here for JJ just to match the Viego. And it looks like he'll just go back to that Lee Sin uh, that we saw so much of uh, MSI. Yeah, the classic, not just for JJ, but for the whole region, really. And now over to the ban phase once more. EDG need to try and set their solo laners up. It's likely going to be a last pick for Flandre. We almost always see top lane as that last pick on the red side. But we'll see what they're going to try and do in terms of bans on which, which pool they want to pinch. And it will be Renato, it turns out. Yeah, Renata makes a lot of sense. Renata Callista is a really popular duo at the moment. You both have passives where if the other person autos, you proc extra damage. It's Callista's W and Renata's uh, passive. And then on top of that, uh, you have obviously the W you can cast on the Callista and you can just like spam autos to a heart's content, content and get that Ren built up. So that will be denied. Could possibly see like a an engaged support band out here, perhaps like the Alistair, the Rel, which you saw earlier. I think Nautilus is less of an issue simply because the Tom Kench can eat you out of the ultimate. Uh, but they are going to ban it away despite that, respecting Hung's proficiency on the champion. And for FPX here, they've kind of just been targeting mids. Could look towards the Ari in the mid lane, something we've still seen had pretty high priority. And Angel just had a fantastic performance on. That is here being banned very consistently today. I was thinking maybe it was a target at Angel. You know, scouts are good as here as well, but I'm starting to think that that is uh, more of a meta thing based on the consistency of it. But again, we are just discovering as we go here in the LPL. Oriana going to be banned away from scout as well. So Control Mage is definitely the target from Care. As he has that Talia, he wants to find himself a good matchup. Yeah, so expect the mid lane pick here. Again, the Ari is something that they could definitely take. As much as the Unraveled Earth from the uh, Talia means you can't dash over it, you shouldn't really be getting in range of it. You can just play around uh, to his effective range and fire charms out from a distance. So they will lock that in. A strong mid jungle to support their bot lane, which will obviously scale really well. And now it's up to FPX to lock in their support and their top lane. Their Shallow, who could take something like the Gnar as a safe blind. I feel like it's been super popular on the current patch. And then for the support role for Hung, uh, might be actually looking towards this as a set that goes in the support role. I'd expect to see it there more likely than top. One of the things with set in the support role is you struggle sometimes to close the gap. But with the cluster throwing you in, it makes it so much easier. Yep, it certainly does. And you can kind of combo it as well where you throw the set in. You can just walk a little bit further forwards, then ult someone back into your team as well. So it's a really powerful combo if you can pull it off. We'll see if they're going to be able to down in that bottom side. Hung certainly good on the hard engage supports. It's going to be a, a, a Camille there. Locked in for Shaolau, who up in the top side. We'll see what Flandre wants to go with. I'm just saying Renekton was always the classic Camille counter, but it doesn't feel like Renekton has been favored recently. Yeah, Renekton really did not enjoy the durability changes. And this might be an old special for Flandre if he does bring this one out. We didn't really see too much of this. Um, and it looks like he's not going in that oh direction. Oh my God, come on. It could just be, <laughs> and it's going to be the Kale. Bit of a consistent right. theme. We obviously just saw the Shy play this twice in a row. One game, not so great. One game went pretty great. Uh, did go the AD build. I do think the AP build is better, uh, especially in this game where you have two AD threats. But we'll see yeah. where he ends up going. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I guess we're seeing that this is not just the, the Shy thing. This is something that is working in scrims in, in LPL because... Flandre bringing this Kale out up against the Camille. So just decided that, look, it's harder to tower dive on 12.10, right? It's really difficult to go for these dives. So people locking at the Kale and saying, look, we're going to scale on the bottom side with the center type Kench. We're going to scale on the top side with a Kale. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah, and it basically means that as long as Kale can manage the waves well and your jungler comes up when it bounces back and you're in a comfortable position where you can get ganked, you're pretty safe because dives are just so hard. You miss execute, very easy for the kill to pick up a double kill, especially post six when you have the ultimate. You tank too many hits while that invulnerability is there. So it gives basically a safe opportunity to scale. 
Now, I do like the Camille pick that came in because into center Tom, you can ult the center, knock the Tom away uh, to disrupt that. I also think that's very good into Ari, but ultimately, if it's given, a, I mean, it would have given a counter matchup regardless, but Fondre clearly feels comfortable on this Kale, picking it to scale up and also provide an extra layer of protection when it comes to those team fights. Yeah, that I mean, the the all obviously huge, uh, and we'll see if you know. My main concern for EDG, right, is you might just lose control of the game early on, right, because you do have the scaling side lanes, uh, could get dangerous for them, and that kind of puts a lot of pressure onto FPX to be the team putting your best foot forward and try and find these advantages early on in the game. Maybe stack those dragons because, you know, if there's one thing Senna Tom Kench can't do, it's get priority in most situations. You don't really have the wave clear, so. Hopefully, for the side of FBX, they'll be able to stack those strikes up, go for the neutral objectives. I mean, is that what you're expecting to see from FBX? Is it a matter of skirmishing? Is it a matter of just trying to play through lanes? I think a big aspect is kind of something we saw from IG in their game two today is fighting numbers advantages with the Talia. Talia really strong at roaming and getting somewhere first. You have the wall that can cut off, and your skirmishing is going to be pretty strong ultimately uh around your mid jungle around the fact that you have camille for the engage so uh, i think that should be the play pattern i think early levels you know if you can pick up the early dragon fantastic early herald again great but it is kind of hard to make things happen with obviously the main playbook for for early lpl teams was go for a dive set up stacked waves three members four members and that isn't really as possible anymore so I kind of expect a slower early game and then the mid game to be a bit more explosive for FBX and that's where they start to try and ramp up. I will say for the side of uh, EDG, the fact they have this Lee Sin, Ari in the mid jungle still means they have some ability to contest. And if they can shut down the Talia, stop her from ever getting a window to move, that can yeah. really have a lot of value. Yep, Scout's certainly a, a very proficient Ari as well. So we'll see if he's going to be able to make that work in the mid lane. And I am curious about what Scout and JJ are going to be up to. I feel like those two linking up and trying to match the roams uh, coming out from FPX could be the way to buy yourself a safe early game. We'll have to wait and see as we're getting ready to head on to Summoner's Rift for our second series of the day, our second series of the split. And I feel like a lot of pressure on FBX here to find early advantages, to find ways to take over the game and, and just snowball like crazy. FBX last split, leaving a lot to be desired, losing to EDG in the playoffs. Now an opportunity for revenge and an aggressive composition to take this game into their own hands. And for EDG, a team that expectations were sky high after their World Championship win. Same roster with a disappointing spring. They want to come in with a strong start to establish that they are back for summer, looking once again towards the World Championship to defend their title. Yeah, we'll have to see if they can have that performance, though, because, uh, again, spring leaving something to be desired. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement there, but perhaps a slower pace of game could you know, favor them a little bit. Viper, certainly an insane late game AD carry. His team fighting is absurdly good. So if you give him a, a scaling pick like this center, certainly should be able to have a good performance on it. Shallow who getting spotted on this ward. Look at Flandre, very far up the lane currently on the Kale, but looks like he'll back away a little bit. Nothing crazy at level one. Clint starting on the top side, whereas JJ starts on that bottom side, will get a leash. And ultimately, I feel like Flandre has a kind of fine time in the early levels. Uh, if the wave is in a bad spot, that's where Camille has fantastic gank set up. And especially if you hit level 6, the ult for Flandre isn't really going to save you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that looks about right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What a way it is. I mean, the reason why this is actually effective and smart is you just traded flashes with the enemy AD carry, but you have Hex Flash. Like, it's actually some in some ways it's better to not have flash on the set because then you can just spam hex flash in the brush constantly and constantly yep. pose that threat so this is 100 percent a winning trade yep. yeah hug is more than happy to go for that trade he'll take that <laughs> trade any day of the week uh, vipers pause the game he's like what what just happened <laughs> you're not allowed to just flash and be like that that's, that's not how this game works we're trying to play slow here guys uh, yeah, we'll figure out what, what the pause is for and hopefully get back into the game. But I loved it. Like, look, Hung has a reputation for the Flash being a basic ability set with Hex Flash. This is, this, is, this is the perfect champion for him. This is his natural habitat anyway. I find it so funny that I was talking about how, for me, both these players, Briar Enchanters and the Spring Split, 
Definitely could see them. No, we get hung. Level one, flashing. Before minions even killed, trading summoners. But, you know, it makes sense. And I love to see the aggression coming out. Particularly, this is how you can punish the Senna Tom. Because Senna Tom, the reason why they benefit so much from the durability patch is if you don't find an all-in window, they will just harass you down. They have so much sustain between the Senna healing and the Tom also obviously has his great health. But if he lands a Tongue Lash, he also heals. So they'll just harass, 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 keep you slowed down, and then eventually win the lane off that and scale up pretty exceptionally. But the thing is, this is so different from the old Senna Tom because Tom can't eat you until level six. So if you get on top of the Senna before level six, you will just die. And ultimately, Tom suffers a little bit similarly to the issues Rakan has. If you get on his AD carry before six, is that his knockup is so telegraphed that if you're going for an all-in, you just flash over it, right? If he tries to W the enemy to carry, flash over it and then kill the kill your opponent. And it's so hard for the Tom to do anything before you can gobble them up. Yeah, it's, it's a really tough one for Tom Kench. And we saw that earlier today, right? We saw Tom Kench versus double range. There was nothing he could do. Uh, and this time he's up against a Callista and a set, which, you know, not double ranged, but set with the true damage on his W. Callista able to just stack that end up, just not pop the E until the shield is gone and then try and one shot the time. So it feels like a good target for, for these Ren stacks to just keep on building on up. But I want to talk about the rest of the map as well. What is the game plan for these two junglers here? Because I feel like, you know, usually you'd say the plan is to build big waves, try and dive that bottom lane right before Tom hits six. But is that still a viable strategy on 1210? That's a big question for me. No, I think it's way too risky. Uh, I think especially with how tanky Tom is, if you try and go for that dive and it's not flawless, you'll just... I mean, the problem is the more members you bring to execute that dive, the more likely it is of succeeding, but also the more turnaround kills the enemy team can get if you end up botching it. So it's, it's very, very precarious. I'm not sure that's the game plan for me. I think... For the Viego for FPX, I think playing towards top after level six makes a lot of sense. Uh, once you have lockdown for Flandre, especially if there's ever an opportunity where the wave is overextended, that's what you can look for. I think for the side of EDG, JJ just wants to play support for his lanes. If you find a gank window in mid, fantastic. Uh, shutting down the clear can make a lot of sense. Oh my god, that is low health for Flandre. Yeah. Low health for Shallow, who as well as uh, the pot's going to be ticking on both sides here. Remember, Flandre does have a heal ability, uh, but I don't think he has it just yet. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't quite see. I think he's got his E and his Q for now, but at level three, we'll have a little bit more sustain. But Shala, who as well, with the leg sweep, the tactical sweep, sorry, uh, will be able to sustain himself up. But getting bullied out of the top side by a Kale. Not an ideal situation. Here we go. Viper going to be ignited. LWX flashing forward. Viper 1 HP, but he survives. Oh. And actually, it's Mako turning it around. EDG find the 2v2. And Mako finds a tasty snack. Yeah, when you disrespect like that, you take a tower hit. And the Tom Kench has so much damage built into that passive. Oh, again, LWX step a little bit too far. And they end up paying for it. LWX goes down, early kill for the Tom Kench, and yeah, bit of an overstep, bit too much aggression, I think. Hung setting up the pace yeah. for that one at that level one. And that is, uh, that's a rough one, because we talked about the level one advantage, right? We talked about the fact that with the flashes gone, should be an advantage for FBX, but overstaying it, overstepping it. And now an advantage for EDG is Mako grabbing that kill. Could be in trouble himself, will be stunned up. Is Tom Kench, though? So you don't really expect him to be under too much threat. Yeah, you see now FX's bot lane is behind. So Hung has to look for an all-in to try and get themselves back into the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see I what mean, he did here. MLX Hung. Yeah, absolutely. Goes for the trade here and the exhaust is cleansed, but just not quite enough damage. The true damage doesn't connect from Hung. Viper able to sidestep it. And then the rend not quite doing enough damage. I think even if the true damage did hit, I don't think it would have quite been enough. Uh, to kill Viper, but ultimately they committed so heavily for that kill that they really had no way of getting back out again for LWX on this cluster. Very nicely done by EDG, finding themselves that opportunity and being so decisive as well, right? Having an advantage in this bottom lane is really terrible news for FBX. Like the fact that EDG are ahead and winning with Senna Tom Kench is just painful because Callista is not one of these champions that's forgiving and will scale in later you know it, it's a really tough situation for them so across the rest of the board though barely even and uh nothing too much to write home about i want to return to the conversation of the junglers though 
because with Drake coming up onto the map, both junglers are pathing towards this bottom side. Still priority for FPX. Even though they lost the kill, they do still have that aggressive matchup. I feel like maybe jungle, could, uh, maybe Dragon could be something Clint could hook. Yeah, I think when you have the priority bot in your cam, but they're going for a reset here. This could actually be an opportunity for JJ to look for it, but the Scuttle Crab has been taken. Enemy team would be aware. You will have the prior in your lanes, though, so... If there's a window, it's now, but I think he doesn't want to risk starting up and getting low. We'll try and get a ward down here and spot out Clid. She wants to go for the 1v1 despite being a level down. A scout trading heavily with care in that mid lane. We'll just be able to force Pryo for himself uh, and move over towards the Drake. So that'll be vision cleared away. And it'll be JJ into the pit here on this one. Will he start the Drake? The vision is gone, but I think he's not really confident enough to actually just kick this one off. Yeah, so they had prior mid, had prior bot. Scout preferred the reset, and also it's just a risky one to go for. Uh, especially the Hextech Dragon, it does so much AoE damage. Uh, I feel like it, it really can be delicate if you start to try and do that one with multiple teammates and then everyone ends up low. Against the likes of a Viego who'll get those resets, it is just a risky one. So playing it slow for now. I think a big thing to highlight though is Flandre has a CS lead in the top lane on this Kale, so in a really comfortable position. I think part of that was uh, we saw initially uh the the lee sin pathing up towards him right we saw jj covering him on the early clear that can make such a big difference because in the ideal world what the uh camille wants is to be able to dive onto the kale but you can't really do that when you know your jungler's on the other side of the map yeah shala who as well trading very aggressively actually getting forced to reset so really uh bad news for him early on in that laning phase and <laughs> with this is, what, the third time today that we've seen early on the Kale actually winning some of these trades in, in situations that I wouldn't have necessarily expected the Kale to win uh, the trades in. So a little bit better for Flandre than it was for the first game of Kale for the Shy. The second game for the Shy, uh, very, very good <laughs> in terms of <laughs> Kale's situation. It was about as good as it possibly can get. Um, but Flandre doing a good job himself as well. And we'll see how that continues. I'm looking towards level six from these mid laders, though. Because you know that the second both of them are level 6, Talia's going to be using the ult to try and find picks. You're going to see Ari matching with the Spirit Rush as well to try and search for opportunities. And both junglers, great at following up on picks as well, right? The Lee Sin and the Viego love to find these skirmishes early. And I think as well, the, the Talia Viego, I like this combo because you have so much single target burst with the Talia. Mm -hmm. Like if you catch someone with the, the knockback through... Uh, you unraveled the earth into you launching your Q at them. You can just absolutely delete someone or get them low enough so that the Viego will finish them off with the ultimate. So I want to see these two moving as a duo, it's looking for those plays. I think if you can go for a gank and get uh, the flash off Flandre, that then means he's going to be vulnerable for quite a bit thereafter, can't push up as freely. And as he's going to be approaching that level six, he will be pushing more freely when, once it becomes a range yep. against melee matchup. That is probably the easiest avenue to punish. Bot lane, there is a window, but I think once Tom Kench hits level 6, it gets a bit painful. With summoners down, though, pre-6, there is definitely opportunity, but it really depends on tracking the enemy jungler. And that's why I kind of said at the start of the day, JJ's role, if you just cover your side lanes and ensure that they're not getting targeted, they should flourish. Yeah, they should be able to uh, find themselves a big advantage. Uh, down in the bottom side, and we'll see if they will. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of, I, I, I assume, tech issues. We'll try and find out what the course of the pauses are it is day one at the end of the day the teams are playing remotely as well i think at the end of the day you can somewhat expect a couple of little technical hiccups but hopefully that'll all be smoothed over and we'll be able to get back onto the action for you guys but edg so far so good it has to be said the 2v2 down at the bottom side going their way and i feel like a comfortable early game like this just slow and steady is perfect for them but what we've seen in the first series is that it wasn't necessarily the laning phase that that decided everything. It was much more about the mid game between the first two teams of the day. Are you expecting a similar thing here in the second series? Yeah, I think so. I think that's when I would expect FPX to come online in terms of what they can start setting up. But basically, you know, it's the durability changes and the strength of the towers has meant a lot of the set plays we see early levels aren't really as doable. So it just means that when you have teams who are trying to be aggressive, it's delayed a bit to, to sort of the mid game. When the map opens up and you start seeing supports moving around, plays with things like the Herald, like you can still get aggressive plays in lane, but it tends to be like, oh, someone's overextended so we can gank, or, you know, Hung is just flashing every two seconds with Hexflash. Those, those are the more opportunities. One thing I do want to note is, you know, when Viper survived on that center, that was literally a durability survival, right? You, you yeah. that Viper would have died there on the center 
pre those changes, which is kind of stark illustration of how these the, like things like the center have been enabled a lot by being so much less vulnerable with that extra health, that extra resists. Honestly, it's the reason I've, I'm kind of surprised at how much aggression we've seen locked in in the bottom side, right? Callista and Draven, both. I mean, Callista, one of the premier picks today. Uh, Draven having a game as well. Like, I was not anticipating this level of aggression down in the bottom side. I was thinking like Cogmores. I was thinking Senes. I was thinking a bit of Lucian, but that's been banned every game. Um, certainly didn't expect Callista and Draven to be this prevalent. So kind of surprising considering the durability changes. Uh, now we have been informed EDG, uh, Viper and Mako re have reported an in-game issue. So that's currently being investigated and hopefully things will be resolved and we'll be able to get back to the action shortly for you guys. Um, but in the meantime, us two chuckleheads will uh, we'll chat away <laughs> about League of yeah. Legends for you. I, I think um, regarding the Callista thing, I think a big aspect of it is you know, if if scaling champions are really enabled by this, then on the counterpart to that, like if you pick like a, a an AD carry that scales reasonably well, uh, it's not gonna do as well into like a super scaler because you'll just get outscaled, right? Whereas if you pick something like super aggressive like the cluster, you have the opportunity to shut down that scaling pick before it gets there. You can't play a passive lane against lanes that are just gonna outscale scale you to a ridiculous degree. You have to like crush them, find the momentum. It's like like when we saw Renekton in Italy. Uh, there was that game, uh, I think there was the game in the LCK where there's like the 10k goal deficit and the Renekton in Italy ended up, like you have to be super aggressive on it if you're going to match these scaling compositions and you can't let your gas off the pedal. If you play these picks that are more like medium scaling, medium early game, you'll just get eclipsed at every point. Uh, so I think it makes sense in that regard, especially Callista to get some buffs and is in a strong position. And I think something's to be said for the fact that a champion like Callista has more than enough damage. If you stack up enough rends, like in those all-ins, you will kill them, right? If you get enough spears into them eventually. Doesn't matter how durable, as long as you have the auto attacks to spare and the spears go in, you will eventually have the damage to finish them off. Yep. If, if the goalkeeper didn't save it, it would have been a goal. If you do enough damage, <laughs> the enemy will die. A That's just make there. them run out of health. It's that simple. This this is the kind of analysis that got my man Orcs onto MSI. That was <laughs> it, the... you know? You got to break it down. Keep it simple. <laughs> I love it. You know, it helps monkey brain play by players like myself. It, it helps us understand the game. Uh, yeah, we'll see if they're going to be able to get enough spears in and find themselves a kill. Um but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Only time will tell. So far, uh, I'll admit I'm a little disappointed uh, by what we've seen in terms mm. of the meta. It's not really what I expected to see. Uh, Didn't like the, the Kale? The Kale, co this consistently, I did not expect. It's like mildly exciting for one game. But when I see it three <laughs> times across four games, I'm like, yeah. oh no. We're headed for a real slow meta if we're seeing Kale picked three times this consistently. Like, I'm a little bit nervous for what this means for the speed of gameplay in the LPL. I wonder how much of this will be isolated to 1210, because something we talked about yeah. earlier today, tower damage is overtuned to the point that on the next patch, on live patch, it has been nerfed. Not quite to what it was before, but it has been toned down a bit. I wonder how much of this is stuff that works on 1210 because dives are very hard mm. and whether we'll see it continue to 1211 when dives aren't very hard, but they're just hard. That's my question. Like how much of this is like specifically on this patch? Like yeah. does Kale suddenly start, get, start getting dove on repeat on the new patch? I don't know. That is, that is the thing to kind of wonder. But for now, it definitely feels like a lot of these picks that had these massive glare and weaknesses just can't be exposed. So I think... You know, a lot of value in the Kale is something that can do that. But I think across the board, we'll see how much teams lean into it. Got to be said, though, I feel like even if you have these scaling elements, you still want to have early agency. I think taking your hands off the wheel mm -hmm. uh, and just leaning so heavily into scaling across the board isn't really the best game plan because teams yeah. will just run away with it and then inject gold into their scaling carries. Certainly will. We're back onto the rift, though. Whatever the issue was seems to have been resolved as we're back into the game once again and uh we'll see who's gonna have the better scaling we'll see who's gonna have the better mid game and we'll see who's gonna get the best of this rematch from playoffs round one of playoffs it was edg versus fbx and edg won three one and fbx wanting to get aggressive wanting revenge and lwx and hung starting off aggressively but going too far 
falling short in that laning phase. It means Viper and Mako with a big advantage and very close to getting Mako to that crucial level six point. Yeah, but Hong does have flash up. And from what I've seen, it, it's almost painful to have your flash available on set. <laughs> so I expect him to be in that any second now just to try and force something from EDG. One big thing to mention as well is the level six for the set actually pretty effective into uh into center tom because either you can oh, yeah oh there it is there's <laughs> I, the said. I will say viper's reactions are insane like yeah, he obviously fast. knew that was coming but the to flash because set stun is instant like to flash that the presence of mind to know that that's coming in and have the reactions to pull it off is, is really impressive. Now pick onto Scout potentially. Charm comes on through though. Big damage onto Clid. And here comes JJ. Spirit rushes are available. The kick, the follow up with the Sonic Wave and Scout. Oh, one more auto. There it is. The Q for the Orb of Deception. And now JJ wants a little bit more, but Shallow who is here. Big damage, but in with Flandre Zulti on top oh, of him. Charm. And the Charm as well. It's too easy for EDG. They make it look like child's play so well played i honestly felt like the talia plus the viego at level six would be such a threat for this mid jungle you have so many dashes between you but scout able to get away from the initial burst damage and then jj just felt like he couldn't miss with those sonic waves there flandre also roaming down with the ultimate to get that aoe damage just super good execution on the back of viper once again being able to get away from that stun from hung feels like this is the kind of edg we were hoping yeah. for in summer you know, we talked about how they didn't necessarily have the greatest split in spring. It feels like that is a distant uh, memory based on the first nine minutes of game play we've seen <laughs> from them. Perhaps we're getting a, a little overzealous. End the split here. Conclusions. It's been nine minutes. EDG <laughs> world champions are back. <laughs> They've done it. Two worlds in a row. Good job, guys. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, though, in the real world, FBX managing to get themselves a Herald here. They are almost 3,000 gold down, though, in nine minutes. That is kind of insane. Yeah, the extra kills, uh, a big factor, but also uh, Viper being able to pick up so much gold on the back of this center, just able to farm up uh, the sacks on your support item. And yeah, Herald being secured by FBX, pretty important. With this gold deficit already coming in, with the concerns about some of these scaling elements of EDG, you really want to be finding a lead. See where they opt to place that down. I think bot lane could make a lot of sense to get your Callista ahead. For now, they're chasing Jiji out the river. Yeah, and Mako could be a target as well. No flash available for him. Pulled back in. The Abyssal died to try and keep himself safe. He actually will walk away from this one. Still has thick skin. Didn't even have to use his shield in this one. And now JJ arrives. Sonic Waves go slightly wide. His LWX slowed. Forced to flash and cleanse on this one. And EDG answer the play in kind. Oh, I mean, ultimately, Care didn't quite find the W in time to interrupt the Abyssal Dive. And as soon as he got that off, he made enough space. As you said, still had the great health. So that big play with the Talia, something we're hoping to see from FBX's mid jungle to try and get things rolling ends up backfiring and i mean lwx is not having fun here no he is not very low on hp underneath the tower and apparently neither is shallow who flandre flashing forwards solo kill on the kale flandre is here to perform yeah i mean all i'm gonna say is that if the kale is solo killing your camille at this point of the game it is not a good omen Looks like Flandre also going for the AD Kale build. So it seems like this is quite a consistent thing LPL tops have been doing in scrims. But FBX things are going from bad Dan, to worse. Dan, just, just look at the CS in that top lane. 35 CS lead for Flandre with a kill and two tower plates. I mean, Shala, who trying to trade here, but just goes disastrous. <sighs> He's two levels down. Yeah. It's painful. It is really painful. I don't see an out. You know, we talked about how the game plan would be, you know, Talia Wall, try and set up plays onto the, the Kale. Uh, once you have that level six available for the mid jungle, hasn't happened. Bot lane, nothing has really come from the fact that they have this Callista set. You haven't been able to find an advantage. Oh, oh the flash charm comes in. Care, gonna be locked up. The sonic wave is there. It's too, oh, actually no oh, care survives. Lord. One HP, the durability patch, saving care I mean, with an inch of his patch. life. Hong interrupted the sonic wave with his E. That was sick. I, I, he certainly would have died if JJ had been able to close the distance. And actually, what JJ was going to do was sonic wave to care, kill him, and then kick Hong backwards to get, like, the two kills. But the interrupt so strong. 
we'll get the replay here. Slow. I want to so, see the uh, slow-mo. Yeah, comes in here, manages to get the interrupt. Oh my Last second, like you, you are dead if that connects. And then the kick would follow. I mean, this is hung in a nutshell. This is why I love watching this. This fire play support mechanics out the wazoo. Yeah, he certainly does. He's more than willing to make the play as well. Hung, having a great performance so far. Unfortunately for him, like any other AD carry, he would have got multiple kills in lane at this point. But unfortunately for him, Viper is literally inhuman when it comes to his reactions. So uh, not able to have the same success in the laning phase. And uh, they continue to get bullied out. Post six, there's another inhuman flash from Viper. As Mako pulled back in, but still has the thick skin. Ren stacking up, maybe a play available for FPX, as they will be able to find Mako Care. Looking for Viper at the same time. Good dodge from Viker though. Viper, my Mako goes down. I'm tripping over my words like crazy, but it's a positive play for FPX. And they did it. Enough spears and the target dies, Joe. I told you they managed to get the kill. Don't find Viper once again so quick on that flash. They managed to take out Mako. They'll be able to throw the Herald down and get that first tower. A lot of gold for the LWX that is needed. But in the meantime, there's a 40 CS lead top. Blondre is taking plates. Yeah. Awesome. It's <laughs> this is essentially a 3 0 and 1 KO. Because the, with the four plates, that's Look essentially at, it's like 6 K gold to 3.7 K. It's a 2.3 K gold lead. It's insane. Well, we said there weren't going to be dives for JJ. Kill the just tower. kills the tower <laughs> and then the, you don't have to die you just finish the tower off oh my days it's gonna be a tower for towers so first tower did go the way of fpx but look at the gold difference it's four thousand at 13 minutes 14 minutes beautiful stuff here from edg next herald coming up in a minute and 20 dragon though only 20 seconds behind it yeah and i mean 2700 gold lead for flandre alone right if you had to pick someone to have that much of a gold lead you wouldn't pick the Kale if you're on FPX's side. You would, you'd absolutely pick anyone but the Kale to have that much of a gold lead. That is painful. Uh, that is honestly really painful. And the fact they haven't been able to shut it down, it's now level 11. That level lead as well. I mean, levels on Kale are just so powerful. It is such a scary position for FPX. Yes, they got that gold lead in the bot lane. They need to run away with that in this game because the clock is ticking. Okay. I've got a new a new game we can play. If we're going to go into a KL meta, if we're going to uh, see slow early games where KL is scaling up, and we're looking for that level 16, then let's have a speedrun challenge. So far, the shy with the record, it was about 25 minutes that he hit level 16 in the previous game. Flandre currently level 11 at 15 minutes. We'll see what time he's able to get that level 16 mark. I easily think he can beat that. I mean, the fact he's crushed lane already, it should yeah. be set up to break that record. Um, is my estimation. I mean, I, I agree completely so far. We'll see if we'll be able to do it. EDG, though, going to start this Herald up. They have such a big lead, it feels like this is uh, inevitable. Scout could be in trouble, though, because that's a Camille, and you don't get to what escape from Camille unless the charm lands before the Hex Deck Ultimator could come on through. There's a shield coming across him as well. He might be able to win this one out. Zonyas has to come on through. Still has his flash available. Oh, oh but he face plants into the wall. That you know was what? a bit of a disaster. I was going to say, until that point, Scout did everything he did. Played it pretty much perfectly. I guess he could have flashed over the Talia stones to not get stunned. But then he flashes into the wall instead. And it's uh, not the best. Not the best final performance. But it's a good pick from FPX. The reason why they wanted that Camille is so you can lock down the Ari when you eventually get to her. Uh, they also yeah. get the dragon off the back of it. And, you know, as much as they lose mid-tower, the Herald was probably going to take yeah, but, it anyway. Yeah, but, My bigger yeah, concern but... is this. <laughs> yeah, look, look at what it cost them. Yes, they get the tower. Yes, they get a kill. Uh, they, in fact, they didn't even get a tower, right? They just got a kill onto, uh, onto Scout. I feel like... It, it took both solo lanes. The game plan for FPX is just pretend top doesn't exist. <laughs> Just out of sight, out of mind. No one pan your cameras towards top lane. Let's just try and win somewhere else. And hopefully, you know, EDG run into them. Flandre forgets the TP and you win the game that way. But uh, yeah, it's <laughs> this top lane situation is getting out of hand. Yeah, out of hand is one way to win it. That's for sure. EDG just dominating right now and uh, doesn't feel like there's much of a reprieve for FPX in the short term at very least. 5,000 gold lead in favor of EDG 
That's not really what you want to see when you've got a Callista on your team. But I will say, it's a welcome change to see EDG playing so decisively and so comfortably uh, on this new patch, right? Coming back from the break, clearly they've been practicing. Clearly, they're in good form. And, you know, RNG publicly saying thank you to EDG for scrimming during the World Championship. So, obviously, the team uh, sorry, during MSI, not the World Championship. So, obviously, EDG will be in good form. They will be well practiced. Yeah, and I think that that's the big thing is like individual performance is one thing, but you know, having a good read on how to play the map, the fact that when this play came out in the bot lane, yes, Scout did get caught out, but the rest of the team in position to capitalize on the top side. GG setting up for Flandre to be able to push up there. Uh, it feels like they are playing well as a team. It's not just about individual merit. And I think that was the big talking point for me off spring. This is a very individually stacked team. Viper and Scout had some fantastic performances in spring, even in playoffs, right? Yeah, up against Weibo, there was a game where Scout and Viper, like 2v4 to fight was exceptional. But they weren't a good team. They were good individuals. And I think that was why it was so surprising compared to what we saw from them at Worlds. This feels like more of a good team play coming out from them, not just individuals. And, you know, it's, it's game one, series one for them. It's still early to say, but it's definitely positive to start in this manner. Look nine minutes ago we said that they were going to win the world championship and nine minutes later i'm convinced <laughs> i stand by what we said at the it's been another minute nine minutes right we're going to measure <laughs> yeah, exactly. it in nine minute increments and just keep going that way the rest of the split every nine minutes of edg gameplay across the course of the split will judge whether or not they're going to win the world championship that's a lot of nine minutes there's going to be a lot of check-ins on progress here yeah well first two nine minutes Looking solid. Uh, we'll see how the third nine minutes goes. Right now, Flandre, level 13, has picked up that wit's end. So, a lot harder for Care to burst him out on that Talia. And uh, is becoming closer and closer, getting closer and closer to that level 16 spike that everyone loves to talk about. Yep. 13 on the clock here. And once again, as you said before, AD Kale consistently here. Going for that wit's end second uh, instead of the Phantom Dancer this time. But even still... Going for that Kraken Slayer. They're obviously preferring the auto attack based Kale uh, here in the LPL. As EDG just taking complete control of the bottom side of the map. Drake isn't up for another minute and 20, but Red Buff is, and that's an objective here in the LPL. Flan Drake could be in trouble though, because the entire squad is here. It's going to be his ulti used. Flashes over the wall. No way does he get out with this one. Clear trying to finish him off. Just about does, but that was a little dicey, honestly. Yeah, a little scary, and I think it kind of shows you need a lot of members to take down this Kale. This is kind of the play I wanted to see earlier from FPX. It's good they're doing it now. Got to credit them for that. But the whole Talia wall upwards, lock the Kale down with the Camille ultimate, and then finish them off, get get the shutdown, and deny Flandre the scaling should have been the game plan. It's just the fact that we're 20 minutes into the game, and this is the first death Flandre has. That's why I'm feeling concerned. But still, yeah. we want more of this from FPX. The one concern as well I have is that Care now will have his wall on cooldown. Shalahu's ult is on cooldown. Clid's ult is on cooldown. Drake is up in 25 seconds. EDG are going to have complete enough to control here. This shouldn't even be contestable from the side of FPX. So FPX now can maybe try and look for vision around Baron. They already have decent vision control here. But EDG want a pick as the charm comes through onto Hung. Will be Callista ult to save his life. And actually Scout doesn't get to move, doesn't get to play. His Viper has to retreat on the play. Hunk flashing forwards to try and find more. His JJ won't go until the Dawning Shadow arrives. Oh. Great kick across the team. Care turns golden, but he's down as well. And it's a kill for Flandre. Mako flashing forward to get onto LWX, but the Tongue Lash not quite enough as the cleanse is used to keep LWX safe. And honestly, that was a sick turnaround from Hung. Clay wasn't there but though for the resets. And honestly, JJ... Played that one so well. Got the Sonic Wave into that beautiful kick. Will be able to secure that Dragon. And, I mean, silver lining for FPX. They did manage to secure that Cloud Dragon earlier. So, this will only be the second for EDG. But even when it felt like FPX found a route into the fight, still getting outmatched. Yeah. And Junja sat on that bench. And he is... Uh shaking his head right now because there's no way he's seen play anytime soon with JJ on fire like this. That was a gorgeous kick onto Care. Yeah, and I feel like Scout dashing in here, it, it's a set who has a Callista paired. Never really going to find that pick. He also had Flash, but he didn't even need to use it to go aggressive. And then we see the dive in, but it's a bit 
too far for hung sonic wave connects in this beautiful kick that comes in from gg to get the double knock up for the follow-up there from the rest of edg it's a nice uh, seismic shove though coming out from care at the end which kind of creates space so we don't see more members of fpx going down but that kick was just so good absolutely beautiful and it means that now edg still maintaining a gold lead but they're slightly uh, they're not quite as far ahead as they were is what i'm trying to say they're only about four thousand gold up now compared to the five thousand they were up before fact, it's getting closer to three thousand but they're back onto the map they did get that drake that we talked about before and now Barrett is the next port of call for the side of EDG. Scout has TP so he can pressure on the bottom side of the map while the rest of EDG take complete control of the top side. Well, I mean, something to be mentioned is we saw such a massive level difference in the top lane, which has been closed by Shallow Who. Like, it's still... This is a concern is that you have, like, a Senna and a, a Kale going into the later stages. Oh! Well, it's going to be Scout caught out for the second time in a row here. Pulled back by Hung, but gobbled up by Mako and kept alive so ultimately scout will be fine on this one will get out with his life has tp so he can reset while the rest of edg kick this baron off hung has no ultimate so this might be difficult for the side of fpx to fight or at least that's what edg are hoping for the tp out from scout behind the play here trying to get the flank going 3000 on the baron edg cautious on this one they don't want a 50 50 charm over the wall everfrost is there it's a kill for scout hung in the meantime getting in but the shield across the whole team flandre invincible and edg are making this look beautiful it's a flawless fight everything going perfectly for them a clean ace and a master class from edg just complete confidence. I felt like there could have been a tenuous situation. Starting with the Baron, all members of FBX in position to go in. LWX still had his ultimate to try and help Hung engage, and yet they still look for it. And the execution, Pixel Perfect, didn't even lose a single member. They'll get the Baron, they'll get this mid here too. And you know, I'm going to say it, Joe. This is the third <laughs> nine minutes we've seen of EDG. It's looking pretty good. Well, uh, we're not quite there yet. We need we need 27. It's only 24 on the clock. They're winning too quickly is the issue that we've got here. Great flank from Scout there, finding the pick. And the rest of the team just they don't have the damage. LWX isn't able to get anything done during this fight because the threat from Scout and the flash charm at the end, beautifully done. I mean, I was honestly concerned about starting this because Scout didn't have ultimate. And I was like, you know, maybe reduces the impact. His flank there was so excellent. Just meant yeah. Karen and LWX couldn't function. And the problem is, in this composition, you kind of need them to start racking up the kills so Clid can get resets. Clid couldn't get the reset there. Kind of this, <laughs> the problem when no one on the enemy team dies. And so as a result, that momentum never came to fruition. And now, EDG 8,000 gold in the lead. Just exploded this game wide open. Pushing into the enemy red side jungle to clear out the vision. And now this wave is being brought up by Flandre. Really yeah. solid play just to make it so hard to defend this tier two. All right. Well, level 16 hit 25-22 on the clock there. I'm curious what the shies was as we get an engage coming out from Clint Viper using his shroud to keep his team as safe as possible as... I don't know what just happened with a Hextech ultimatum. He didn't do anything. Hung pulled them out of it. And now the rest of EDG can re-collapse on the fight. The sustain is too much. Dawning Shadow rails the whole squad from FBX. And EDG once again just destroy FBX in a fight. They push on forwards. They'll take the bottom lane towers. And I think they might just take the game. Safety net after safety net after safety net for this Kale. FX try and find the play, but Flandre does not go down. And the turnaround is swift, and they will get demolished. Karen Clid, I don't think you can defend this. Yeah, I don't think so. Not if the team actually starts hitting the next towers. They're just clearing the minions for the time being. Flandre's they farming. They can finally start to <laughs> push this one over. It's going to be Clid forced back to his nexus but actually edg not going to try and end just yet they're going to go for this mid lane tower instead play this one by the book take a couple of inhibitors first they might even go for a cheeky reset yeah plenty safe they probably could have ended but it might have left an opportunity for fbx to find a way in with the respawns and turn it around they didn't want to overstay on the next wave uh especially with how threatening towers are right now i feel like everyone's oh, just so afraid of towers they are looking for a pick now Clint. 
Cliff forced to flash away. Scout is on the other side of the play as well. Everfrost slows him down. Sonic Wave is there. And Mako actually eats him to make sure the pick can happen. That's the jungler down. Guaranteed Drake. But I don't think EDG would a Drake right now. They want a game. In goes JJ with a KLO. And it's a double for Flandre. As a third one goes his way as well. Eight. One and seven on the Kale as Viper should have the range to finish off Xiao Lao Hu. The legs will do nothing whether they're scissors or not. It's going to be the Nexus falling here. And EDG come into the summer split and show us what they are made of. I mean, considering we had these two play each other in playoffs and EDG won by all means, but the fact that they come in now and just absolutely massacre them, make it look not even close when they only got one round further than FPX in playoffs.